Right, now for paper one. Again, I have copied the QCA marking guide question uh, answers and pasted them into the question paper, as you'll see in a moment. And you can obviously get these for yourself from the website, but what it, what they give you the answers, but sometimes that's not enough. I'm going to try and explain the answers if they need explaining. If they're simple, like this first one, for example, then clearly it's just content knowledge. Question one, part A, or question 21, part A, identify whether two bromopropane is saturated or unsaturated. Saturated means single bonds only, unsaturated means double or triple bonds. It doesn't have double or triple bonds, and therefore it is saturated. Now that's worth two marks. So you get one mark for saying it's saturated and one mark for saying why. Um, is it a primary, secondary, or tertiary halogenoalkane? Now, hopefully, you again, you know this. It's a secondary halogenoalkane. What you need to do is, you don't need to draw this. I've only put this in, in for you for sort of helping you understand. The carbon atom containing the bromine is the one you're looking at. If it's got one carbon and, a, and the, the rest of the atoms are hydrogens attached to it, it's primary. If it's got two carbons, like this one has, it's secondary. And if this hydrogen was a carbon as well, then it would be tertiary. Same applies to alcohols where Br would be replaced by OH. Question 22. Calculate the concentration of HF in an aqueous solution with a pH of 4. Ka is given to you. Show your working. Okay, so effectively, uh, the concentration of HF is what we're trying to find. Now, uh, so there's QCA's answer effectively. But at the bottom line is you are changing HF into H plus and F minus. If the pH is 4, then H plus must be 10 to the minus 4. And so is F minus because they will form 1 to 1 from HF. So effectively, if they give you the Ka, now normally we see Ka on the left and HF on the bottom, but hopefully you can see all they've done is simply rearrange it and got the answer. Okay. Um, I haven't put the answer there as well, but you need to put it there, guys. Okay. You must work it out and then put the answer there again. Okay. I don't think... Uh, it'll be a problem if you don't, but let's not take any chances. If they've given you a box for the answer, use it. Okay, ibuprofen is manufactured using two different processes. Now, it can, you can see in process one, um, basically, what do we got here? Let's have a look. So the reagents are... Process one, process two. Okay. So effectively, all you've got to do for this one is simply put the mass of the desired product, which is 206, over the mass, total mass of reagents, which is 514.5, multiply by 100 to get the atom economy. In the second one, you're putting that same 206 over 266. All right, now you will see that process two obviously has the better atom economy. And what does it say? Um, the environmental impact of each process, well, clearly the one with the better atom economy will be the more environmentally friendly. Because at the end of the day, uh, or economic as well, I beg your pardon. So economic and environmental process two is better because it makes more of it. So from the economic point of view, you're getting better outcome, better yield, and therefore more profit. And also, if it's not producing too many waste products, it's better than, obviously, from an environmental point of view. Uh, electrochemical cells constructed using uh, copper and platinum electrodes. So we've got the copper half cell, and we've got the Fe3, Fe2 half cell. There's no metal there, guys, so you do need platinum, obviously, as an electrode. Compare the standard electropotential of the two half cells. 
So what we are looking at here basically is we get our data book. We look up the values of the two. You'll find that they both have a positive standard reduction potential. That's compared to the standard hydrogen electrode, which is zero. Um, offhand, I know the copper one is plus 0.34. I think the Fe3 plus 2 plus is 0.77. I'm not absolutely sure, but you get that from your data book. Okay. The platinum half cell is more positive than the copper half cell. So we're comparing. So we've got to say what is similar about them, what is different about them. Um, it doesn't really ask for significance, but use this as your kind of blueprint if they ask, compare again, guys, okay? I think that's a bit vague, to be honest with you. Anyway, the copper electrode um, in this case here would be oxidized. So basically, it's going to go in the direction shown. Copper is the reducing agent. It gets oxidized to copper 2 plus. Fe3 plus is the oxidizing agent getting reduced to Fe2 plus, okay? Okay, um, the balanced equation for that effectively then would be copper is reacting with Fe3 plus to make copper 2 plus and Fe2 plus. This will involve two electrons, this only one, so these would need to be doubled. So two Fe3 plus and copper gives Cu2 plus and two Fe2 plus. Cell potential, we've already said that. Uh, remember when you're doing these, um, keep the one further down going in the forward direction because you want to get a positive EMF. Reverse the copper one. Um, so get your data book. You will see that copper is above Fe or Fe3 plus. And effectively, that means the Fe3 plus one needs to go forwards, which keeps its value of 0.77. And the copper one will go backwards. The 0.34 will then become a negative, and that will give you an overall positive 0.43 volts. Again, put the answer in there. The oxidizing agent is Fe3+, plus because basically it's going from a plus 3 to a plus 2. It's being reduced. Okay, uh, three unknown gases are combined in a sealed flask and allowed to reach equilibrium as shown by the equation. Will it reach a dynamic equilibrium? Let's have a look. They combine in a sealed flask. That means it's a closed system. Since it's closed, it will reach equilibrium. Okay? Matter is not exchanged with the surroundings. Energy can be, but matter can't be. Okay, um, eventually, of course, the rate of the forward reaction will equal the rate of the reverse reaction, and that is when equilibrium is reached. Uh, if you want to see how the marks are allocated, it's pretty obvious, I think, obviously, you know, where the three marks are. But if you're not sure, go and look at the QCAA mark guide, which you will get on the website, and it'll say the actual sort of mark allocation. Okay, determine if the relative positions of equilibrium lies towards the products or reactants if the molar concentrations are 3.4, 1.8, and 4.2. So effectively, we work out Kc using those values, remembering, of course, you know, to square this one, to cube that one, remembering this. When you do that, the Kc works out to be 0.25. Since it's less than 1, we can deduce the equilibrium is on the left. Uh, three unknown solutions, A, B, C, have the following properties. Determine the pH of solution A. Take the negative log of that, and you'll get a value of 4. Again, put the answer in the box, please. Determine the concentration of hydrogen ions in B. This time you would do 10 to the minus pH, 10 to the minus 2, which is 0 0.01. Again, put the answer in the box. And the pH of C... Well, if the H plus is 0 0.063, we need to do a little bit of calculation. First of all, work out the pH by taking the negative log of that, and then obviously subtract that from 14 to get the pOH. Uh, they give you things to help you with these in the data book right at the very start. They tell you that I think H plus times OH minus is 10 to the minus 14. That, of course, is the um, KW. But at the same time, pH and pOH add to make 14. 
again with the answer in the box, please. Five color solutions, ammonia, HCl, KOH, sulfuric acid, and propanoic acid have lost their labels, and they are labeled with A, B, C, D, and E. Conductivity and the color of each solution when phenol red is added, uh, phenol red is added, is shown. Okay, now the bottom line basically is conductivity is a guide of how much dissociates. If it dissociates completely, you're going to get a good conductivity. So in other words, A, D, and E are going to be pretty highly dissociated. Um, that would mean that they would be HCl, KOH, and H2SO4. H2SO4, because of the two H pluses, will obviously have an even better conductivity. So D would be sulfuric acid. Now, A is 4.1 and E is 4.9. So it's not easy to tell which is HCl and KOH from that, but the color of the indicator is obviously a giveaway. So the yellow means that A is hydrochloric acid, and the red means that E is KOH. Now the other two obviously are weak. That's a weak base, that's a weak acid. They won't dissociate fully. They will both have low conductivities, the red, obviously, would be the base, which is ammonia, and the yellow would be the propanoic acid. Okay, so hopefully that's all simple and answered. Um, oh, and that's the end of the paper. Oh, well, that was good. Okay, so um, hopefully that last one is okay. Remember, you will need to use the data book to look up phenol red. And clearly, you will see the data it'll give you there is that it's yellow when the pH is below 6.8 and red when it's above 8.4. So these will be the acids. These will be the bases. All right. And the conductivity is telling you how strong or weak the acid or the base is um, by its conductivity. Okay, that's that.